All right, next up we have Gustavo Carvalho and Lucas, who also uh, delivered a really cool talk upstairs yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they will be talking about versioning CRDs. Uh, we'll have this half an hour session now. Uh, we'll take a few questions after, but uh, I also want to bring to your attention so you can plan this better for later. We are going to have a series of lightning talks after that. And yeah, this is supposed to be the most fun segment of rejects as we've seen over the years and with several iterations. So it will be like five minutes and timed talks. I don't know if you've seen the roster in the whiteboard as well. We've just kept some space for spontaneity and for anyone to sign up if they're interested in giving like five minute talks. But um, yeah, just letting you know that that's what's coming right after this. Uh, we'll have a 10 minute short 10 minute break and then we'll have the series of lightning talks. All right then, so take it away, Lucas and Gustavo. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So yeah, we'll be talking about version of CRDs, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, the presenter is off. Uh, okay, so my name is Lucas. I'm an engineer at Red Hat. Uh, you can find me at those handles. Uh, Gustavo is an engineer at uh, Container Solutions, and please talk to us, uh, reach us out for any questions and talking about operators and anything on Kubernetes. So this talk is not about external secrets, even though we use a lot of uh, examples from it, external secrets operator. It's mostly, it will be interesting to people that are trying to develop Kubernetes controllers or operators to run inside of Kubernetes. And especially if you're dealing with like upgrading API versions. Uh, but in any case, reach out uh, to us to talk about external secrets. We wouldn't mind, of course. Yeah, why we are doing this talk. So we wanted to provide a good experience, like when upgrading uh, our project to have new features and then because of that having new API uh, changes. And when doing uh, this type of uh, API versioning and like trying to change things, we like encountered like poor support in Kubernetes, like mostly in documentation and like having difficulty finding other examples of doing that like properly, like giving usability to users when uh, they have a hard or like a breaking change, a hard upgrade path. So yeah, the idea to give this talk is to have this being open on the internet and people can find this talk and see the difficulties that we have and the things that we did like to overcome these difficulties. So what we mean by API versioning? So versioning in general is a pretty like controversial topic and sometimes it's hard to keep up like with Windows going from 95 to 98 and then 2000 and XP, Star Wars going backwards and forwards and all that. But like for us, we are focusing not on the software uh, versioning. So when we're thinking about Kubernetes, we're not thinking about 126, 127 and all that. We're thinking about API versioning, so internal API versioning. And if you uh, applied some custom resources or even Kubernetes resources, you're probably familiar with this like concept and this standard. So V something alpha something, V1 alpha one, V1 beta one and all that. The idea is that on alpha versions, you, it's kind of free for all. The changes can be breaking changes. The idea is that you want to get things fast so you can like get feedback and uh, while we are, you are considering yourself not stable, you take advantage of that to make changes fast. The idea that when you go to v beta 1 or beta versions in general, you try to avoid breaking changes, but you can still have them, but you, it's better to like have a bit more comprehensive uh, instructions for people to upgrade them the, to new versions. And the idea is that when you go to like stable versions, like actual versions, v1, v2, v3, the idea is that inside a version, you don't have that many changes, no changes, uh, ideally, and things are stable and people can consider that, okay, this manifest that I'm applying will always work. Okay, so why do, do we say that this is hard? So when you're changing APIs and like fields are optional, like it's optional fields, it's okay, mostly okay to change things there, but when it's a 
mandatory field, and it's like a big structure field, like in this example, you have like authenticating this field, it's the key, and then yes, please is the value, and you're changing like to, okay, the key here will have an object inside with this key value, and then this is a breaking change. This will make life hard for users and for developers because they have to deal with support and all that. So, what do we mean about what we want to do here? Uh, basically, we want to provide some examples, some real-life examples that we faced while on external secrets operator. What are the paths that you can do when you need to introduce that breaking change on your project? Because our crystal balls are not perfect yet, so we cannot really foresee how our software is going to be used. Guys, can you shut up, please? Sorry for... Thank you. Thank you. I cannot go with this presentation without talking about the very first use case, which is how to do a breaking change, how to provide a good path for your users. You don't. Sometimes you don't really need to. The case that we have here on ESO itself, recently we have released this push secret CRD, very cool feature. If you don't know about it, talk to us later. But when we released it, we released it with a bug the actual spec that was here was a little bit different than the one that we designed for. It was basically here was an array, and we really wanted to only have a key value pair here. When we caught that, we thought, well, this is a bug. We need to fix this bug. When we did that, we didn't really thought about providing a path for users to not break their setup because this was a bug. We just documented that as a bug, put on the release note, this has happened, sorry, please provide it. We did this fast, though. So, how does it work? Well, here we are thinking, mm, I have this very missing important feature in my project. So we go from V1 of a 1, create a V1 of a 2, break things, do this over and over and over again until we completely get our domain, until we have everything complete. When we are onto this stage, then we are, okay, good, done. I can now move my V1 alpha onto beta and onto stable GA generally available. My job here is done. My operator is complete. That's very nice until our fancy user here realizes that this project is not stable at all. So he's just like, cool, very cool, nice features. I just wanted something that didn't break my production setup. I would just go use that other project just because it's easier to manage, easier to deploy. This here is actually the problem when we don't provide an upgrade path. And by don't providing an upgrade path here, what I really mean is documentation only. Most projects that we see on CNCF only have documentations when they provide breaking changes. There is a reason for that. We first started with this, we thought, okay, that's not good, let's find other ways. Before showing other ways, pros of that setup. Super easy to manage, no extra code for the whole things that you are adding. You only have the documentation. You don't need to bump it away from V1 alpha 1, just like in our case in external secrets, we just replaced it. And sometimes, like for bug fixes, it actually makes sense. And as we already told, some cons here, it really limits the possibility of us really saying that our project is using a beta version. Uh, it's not really future-proof, just like I said. It's very hard to get the domain design of our controller from the very first day. And you do get the low credibility with any enterprise users. If you're thinking about open source software health, this is a very, very big issue. How can we do it differently? Second option. Scripts. How does scripts work? Basically, what we did on ESO, a little bit of context before going there, some history. ESO used to be called Kubernetes External Secrets, a project that was designed on JavaScript using a JavaScript operator based on the Kubernetes JavaScript client. That client got deprecated. <laughs> so what we needed to do was to switch from the JavaScript implementation into Golang, because the whole cloud native space kind of supports it better. When we did that, it was a whole community effort. We also kind of figured out that our domain was not properly right. So we went on to breaking things. Instead of having authentication things here, 
we decided to have a proper CRD for authentication and another one for the actual manifest. How do we do scripts? The logic is that we are going to have a given group for the first version that we have. We are, that is the group that we want to deprecate. We are going to create a new group here and provide a script for our users to convert. After that script is there, we can safely deprecate the old one and do the life cycle of the new one, however we want. This life cycle here is a life cycle. So that one, the new group, you intend to promote to v1, beta1, to whatever, to keep adding features, etc. And that's the problem. Your user here kind of caught on the train later. Five years after you did that script here, when you're already on v3, v4, they want to upgrade it. So they start to wonder, how can I actually go from this one here up to this one here? That is only possible if you actually maintain that script over and over again for every new version. You already get the pain, right? So obviously, pros. It is very good to have the all-in capacity for any customization need that you want. For ESO, it was kind of the only way around when we were doing that transaction. Uh, your use cases can be scaled out by the community as long as you also open source the tool that does the conversion. And multiple controllers are supported, so literally different code bases can be made compatible. Very cool feature. Cons, that's not a typo. All in is both a pro and a con. Having the extra code to manage the extra complexity, the extra issues that comes with it, is not really for free, and it's not for a feature. You're just providing an upgrade path, and you have to deal with a lot of stuff. Uh, this only really works if every new feature that you have, you backport to the CLI tool. Otherwise, you're going to have the issue that we mentioned. And from experience, doing a live migration, which is being on one project in production and going to the other project, can be tricky for many different reasons. One only to mention, ownership of your resources. So you need to be careful with that. Both of these two options here don't use any Kubernetes infrastructure at all. It's basically outside of Kubernetes trying to handle with migrations. This, uh, sorry, before that, this is the link of the open source tool that we had. If you want to check it out, you can also see that the community adherence for that was pretty low, so it happens. The only way to do that Kubernetes native is by this bit here called conversion webhooks. For those that are not aware, when you define a CRD, you can define the conversion mechanism. Kubernetes supports two. One of them, the conversion webhook, you configure it the way you want. The other one is called none. That's right, Kubernetes provides two ways, either none of it or full-fledged customized. That's really something that can be pain. An example of how we use that to external secrets is the very basic example that Lucas gave. We had a data from object in our v1 alpha 1. We wanted to add a second type of data from for our users. So we got the old one and wanted to wrap into a field. So the old one is now under data from extract instead of simply data from. Just to add another way of people to get information from. That works marvelously in theory. In theory, all you need to do on your CRD, you tell Kubernetes, talk to a webhook. Super marvelous. What's the issue here? The custom resource definition defines how our application works. On that bit, we are now starting to add environment-dependent information, the service that the webhook is using, where the, names, the namespace where the webhook is installed, what certificates are the webhook using. Certificates, we also need to handle certificates. Your user is going to be very, very frustrated when they found out, find out that this happens. Even worse, this is only useful for any user that is here. Any user that is here will be just pissed that they need to install a whole webhook just to handle conversion. 
And it becomes very tricky because now you need to address all of this type of things just to add this little temporary conversion. It does have a nice pro feature. Migrations are live, handled by Kubernetes. So literally, your user, when they are migrating versions, won't fill it unless there are some, I don't know, uh, outages while the migration is happening. It's also cool that you only have one source of truth, so everything is embedded in the same code base. You don't need to handle type conversion like you would need to do when using scripts. It is well integrated with the code base. However, it's very complex to set up certificates. If you have an outage, you now have to deal with etcd version migration, just like any other version upgrade. This would work for Kubernetes as well. This is dangerous if you have an outage. You may need to template your CRD definitions. This may here is actually you will need to. So if you have Helm users, forget about them. They will be complaining forever. They do complain with us. And this one here that I didn't talk yet, cluster networking starts to become important. If you, this is true for if you already are using a validating or a mutating webhook. If you are not, it means that now you will start to have issues like this project doesn't work on my EKS version 1.8.3 Fargate because the port's not right, and, and it's true. Or this project doesn't work on my GKE Calico enabled cluster, and it's true. There you need to enable a host network. If you're really looking that for the users, like we said we're doing, you now need to allocate capacity just to answer them. You need to look to their specific environment. So you also need to be aware of that. Note that this is the only Kubernetes available way of doing conversions. When we, we did that kind of in the order, first one, second one, third one, when we did the third one, it was a little bit last year, close to KubeCon Valencia. I went to KubeCon Valencia, started talking to a lot of CNCF projects. How did they do that? How did they use conversion webhooks? They said to me, well, we don't, or well, we use scripts. And I was like, okay, why didn't I find this information before? That was kind of why we decided to actually try to do this talk, because community needs to know somehow that they don't need to spend a whole year, get a ticket to keep going, talk to people to figure out that, no, this is just hard. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, this slide is basically showing a silver bullet being shot at a swarm of bees. So not, not even a silver bullet can kill a swarm of bees. The, the saying that a silver bullet solves everything. And it all comes down to like requirements and understanding like the impact that you want to have and the, the effort that you want to put in. And yeah, so we're starting to think, how could this be, how could this look like a, a little bit better from the Kubernetes uh, side? Because doing this talk and all the experience that we had, it all comes down to like, it's too hard to deal with Kubernetes API versioning and, and, and API uh, conversion. And as Gustavo said, it's a new thing that you need to put on uh, customer uh, clusters. So it's a new certificate manager. You need or to tell them how to use a cert, a cert manager somehow, or provide a certificate manager yourself, and code a, a webhook from scratch, and deploy that to the uh, customer cl uh, cl cluster. And it's the only way to do conversion uh, like natively. And the CRD definition, as Gustavo said, carries everything, so context-specific information, the namespace where the webhook is running, everything. And we thought about this, and okay, maybe separating the, the conversion-specific things from the, the custom resource-specific things would uh, help improve this, but it's not that simple. And then we thought about something even more complicated, but it would, be, would give a lot of quality of life uh, uh, value, like, having a dedicated manifest for like custom conversion definition. In this manifest, we will define, okay, two versions and how to convert from one version to the other. And this would be a bit easier, Make, making Kubernetes controllers or making operators would look like uh, something that you couldn't deliver and then make users have a, 
uh, actual uh, upgrade path that makes it usable. And, but we understand that this is a big ask, and maybe a huge Kubernetes enhancement proposal. Getting something like this into Kubernetes would take, I don't know, years. And maybe th this also doesn't make sense because it was like two people thinking, and then when you open to the community, maybe you can see a lot of problems that could arise with this. But yeah, it's just uh, something that we could think about. And then, like, since we don't have that, uh, we can think about everything that we already talked in that, this talk. So the first thing, you need to try to provide a clean path for upgrades, uh, avoiding breaking chains. But if you can't, and well, you won't most of the time, especially if you are like in the beginning on alpha, try to introduce breaking changes as fast as you can, like right away. If you get a version out, you uh, notice something wrong, try to change that as fast as you can and take advantage of being in alpha if you are. Uh, this will save you the trouble of handling API versioning and conversioning later on. And the thing about like thinking about uh, clean upgrade paths, it's also at the design time. When you're thinking about your API, you're designing your CRD, you're creating a discussion, you're creating an issue, a big pull request, you're getting everyone to contribute. Okay, this field won't work because this feature in the future uh, will have this and this and that. We'll need more fields. We need this to be an array or maybe an object. And like the discussions will save you time in the, in the future. If you need to introduce a breaking change later on, maybe after you are on beta, beta v1, beta 1, or something like that, uh, if you're trying to avoid like complicated things, maybe you want to go for scripts. Maybe you just want to say, okay, uh, you're like changing domains and use the script that you provide, or maybe go through this documentation and you can like go from one version to the, to the other. But then you have to think about using conversion webhook when you're thinking about usability, and you're already using maybe some validation uh, webhooks on your cluster, you're already managing certificates, you're like familiar with that, and you're providing a project, maybe it's an internal uh, operator inside your company, then you can go uh, with like managing and uh, instructing how to manage certificates and writing a webhook from scratch. Yeah, and the idea is like, don't do this alone, we kind of did this alone because we looked for other projects, like how they managed uh, conversion uh, from going from one uh, API version to the other, and we noticed that they just don't. They do breaking changes. They say, okay, this is our release notes. This is the documentation, if we have it, and deal with it. And yeah, doing this talk was like, okay, we need this to get online and people to start discussing conversion like in a way that is actually usable by people. Uh, you can find us on Kubernetes Slack, uh, on external secrets or external secrets dash dev. And yeah, please talk to us. And yeah, let's make this better. Questions? Thank you. The microphone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Firstly, great talk. Uh, I super sympathise. Um, so uh, I should say the reason why I super sympathise. Uh, I'm Nick Young. I'm one of the maintainers for Gateway API. Uh, we are building like a Kubernetes upstream API using CRDs. We have all of the problems that you have discussed plus more. Um, and a couple, a couple of questions I wanted to ask you was, when you were looking for this, did you ever get referred to the uh, API conventions doc or the API changes doc? Yeah. You did? Okay, good, good. Because those are, those are the Bible, right? Like those are all of the experience that the upstream core stuff has had. That can really help. It is hard because they are both like 10,000 word documents um, that really, really, really need better summarizing. Um, I have been, it's been a wish list of mine to do it for a while, so, but yeah, so it's not much of a question, I'm sorry, but like, uh, <laughs> I, what I wanted to say was um, for, for everyone else who has these sort of questions, there are other people who are doing this. Um, I'm Young Nick on Kubernetes Slack. Um, please feel free to reach out to me, any of you guys, anyone else who's watching this recording. Um, I'm always willing to talk to people about CRD design. I've had to do it a lot too, so yeah. That's Sorry. perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, let's try to not really <laughs> ask a question. <laughs> Let me move the, the microphone. Thanks a lot for actually putting yourself out there as well. It's like we do need it. 
So you, you gave probably three options. One is don't do anything. Two was you have to use bash scripts. And three was the conversion webhook. But if you look at the source code of Minio, they have the same problem with their internal schema for their config file. And what they simply do when they load up is they look at what's present, and they automatically upgrade and write back. Why wouldn't you just do that in your operator? That's actually a valid option. Even if you look at Kida, they actually do something similar. They have external providers that they maintain as a single config map. Back at the time, we didn't want to introduce the config map because we had from one side a very forced uh, config block. The other side, we wanted to keep things uh, on a going level more structured. So it would be a breaking change if we just open for a config map like Keta did. That's why we did not consider. It is valid, but then you start to need to have some thinking about runtime validation. The config map will be just a map string string. So you sorry, sorry, just interrupt. I'm not suggesting you use a config map. If you load up, like we did this for Kubernetes when they changed the ingress, right? So you have either the one that was in the beta namespace or the networking v1. You can load up your operator, external sequence operator, scan for objects for the old type, then either delete them and recreate them or create the new ones and delete the old ones. Why wouldn't you consider that as an option? So no conversion, deleting and just replacing. Yeah, whatever way you want to do it. But then you're yeah. considering different groups, right? And like going from inside a, a group and going for another version, just upgrading. Well, you showed that in your breaking changes, didn't you? Like, we'll have alpha v1 and alpha v2, and you just got to move. So you could do that through your operator, and you've got the knowledge of how to upgrade as well. Yeah. That what I'm saying is, rather than using like a Kubernetes conversion label, you build the conversion yeah, and that, yeah. you know that's called a database migration. It's been around that, for 50 years. You know, if, if we, we don't look need to at, reinvent the wheel. Necessarily. If we look at the Kube Builder support for it, which is where External Secrets is based, is a little bit tricky to ask for Kube Builder to maintain two API versions of the same group. So we would need yeah. to have to split them apart in two groups and have two controllers. Yeah, that's custom code, yeah. Which is kind of mixed between scripts, right? I mean, the script is not running on your cluster. What we're basically doing is making the script into the controller, the controller. sort of. We yeah. really didn't want to do that because we had a very bad experience with scripts. So we decided when we needed to face the problem again to try something native with the CRD versioning, which honestly, I kind of regret it, to be fairly honest. So you, you could still do it uh, by in the new version, you just watch and operate only on the new objects. But then every time uh, when you have, every time you just have a loop that kind of watch for old objects and convert them to the new one. Anyways, um, yeah. The issue with that is that on the CRD level, when we think about versions on the same group, yes. you need to tell them which one is going to be stored on etcd, right? And only one can be stored. Yes which means that you expect a given controller to only be working for a given, little, given moment in time, and that controller will try to update things, right? Yeah. Also, what about GitOps uh, in general? So, yeah, I, I mean, I would say hmm. that the, um, the, the approach you're talking about is, is, does work. I think that the biggest problem... Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. The biggest, the, the approach you're talking about with using a you sort of using a con built-in controller, I um, think it does work. But the the biggest problem that you're going to have is what you said is that you're going to duplicate the types, and you're going to have to maintain the duplicated types. And it only it, it works best when your types are relatively similar. If you've made a really big breaking change between a ver API versions, yeah, like yeah, the, the, yeah, 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 totally, yeah, right, yeah, and it sucks, right? Like you know, and so like I mean, it, forget your API between uh, v1 alpha one and v1 alpha two, we completely changed the way that some stuff worked, and it was just it's not it, it requires a person uh, to to perform the conversion. Sometimes the changes that you are making are going to be big enough; they require a person to perform the conversion because it needs to be semantically reinterpreted. Um, and in that case, you can't do automated migration, right? Like, and you are better off saying to people, no, this is a breaking change. A person has to do it. You know, we'll give you a tool to make it easier or something like that. That happens a bit, that happens also with, say, conversion from ingress to gateway API is another example, right? Like, there is a semantic change between the two things. So there's no point trying to make it automatic. You need people to do it. 
Um, and so I think that's it's a really good point that you've called out that that the um, you know that the risk with the the script sort of automated model is that the the number of changes you can make are limited and the um, the uh, you know, in, in sort of the scope of the changes that can be supported for that code thing are limited. And then, of course, as you called out again, uh, then you have to maintain that for, uh, let's, let's be charitable and say the foreseeable future rather than forever, but let, let's, it's all, to be real, it's forever, right? Like, you know, that's, that code has to live forever for some given value of forever. Um, and, so, and that sucks, right? Like having to maintain that forever sucks. Um, you know, yeah, so I, I think your points are really fair, I, 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 but I do think your point about it is possible to do it in control and yeah. that's a fourth option is fair, but like it does, yeah, there are, of course, there are trade offs there too, just like with everything else. If you're on standard tickets, the back case, yeah, don't want to install, yeah, a tier list certificates, then it's no, well, it's basically the same thing about that, yeah, yeah, about those issues, yeah. 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 The main reason that we wanted to show these three options is just because are the three options that we ended up using we, yeah, due we to went very different them, yeah. reasons. Sure. But just like we put here, we, sorry, here, we do know this is very opinion based and this is just the struggle, the path that we took. And I actually appreciate because here we have so many people that are way more non knowledgeable. Yeah, and it's subject, so. interesting that we have three people that uh, like have experience in this. And like when we were, were like ex actually Gustavo were in previous KubeCon, he talked to a lot of projects and then just said, "Okay, just don't do that." <laughs> I know. At least, yeah, we have <laughs> all three done very big mig migrations. Anyways, um, did you consider using the certificates API for getting the the certificates? I think yeah. yeah, I think yes. we're already <laughs> running out of time. Yeah, what, what are, uh, uh, sorry to bug up. Sorry to bug up the <laughs> mic, everybody. But like, what I actually suggest is, um, please, anyone who's interested in this, reach out to me on uh, Kubernetes Slack. I would actually like to try. I think that it might even be worth us trying to start up a working group around making this, making solving this problem a little better. Um, it's going to be a SIG, a SIG API machinery thing, um, you know, which. For especially for folk who haven't talked to uh, Jordan or Lava Lamp, yeah, 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 but I mean, I think I think that there's enough things now using CRDs that it's probably going to be worth having another crack. So totally um, agree. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but thank you very much for this talk, guys. Really great. I'm going to be telling everybody to to check it out on YouTube and stuff. So thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, thanks. Give us applause.